few, I think, come from a, di a quite different background than I do. Uh, and it, so it's very exciting for me to, to learn um, from what you can get out of uh, more uh, experimental settings, uh, but with a lot of theory um, uh, and strong modeling. That's, that's very exciting for me. And, and so it, I apologize if I'm using a slightly different terminology um, to, uh, to describe some of the things as I come from uh, biology and, um, and medicine. And, and, and a lot of the focus here will be um, also on technology. Uh, so I will, I will talk about um, the human gut microbiome and how it can impact the, uh, the serum metabolites that we are measuring in humans and how that all together connect to insulin sensitivity um, in humans. Uh, I would also like to say that, that um, I work at a, at a consultancy company called Clinical Microbiomics that is a contract research uh, but it, it works pretty much as, an in, uh, as we, you would do in academia, uh, but we, of course, do it uh, for clients, which the clients are both academic and industrial. Okay, so uh, in, um, in analyzing and understanding the, the microbiome on, on humans, um, uh, the methods, uh, the preferred method has recently been to do metagenomics and, and uh, doing that with the deep sequencing, and, um, and, and we have learned that you can get a lot of precision out of using shotgun metagenomics over 16S metagenomics. I think that is now fairly established in the literature, and, and uh, I think uh, everybody that works with this uh, are aware of that. And, and some of the limitations you have from uh, 16S amplicon sequencing, so that uh, if I just back up a little bit, 16S uh, amplicon sequencing, you sequence one gene that has a good resolution in tax taxonomical resolution, and you sequence that, and then you compare um, all of those sequences you get to databases. There are, there are a number of problems with that. One of the problems is that you have a PCR step, and PCR um, is, is an... Uh, uh, exponential amplification of your signal. And that's known to have a lot of biases in it. So the, the different taxes will amplify to different amounts. Also, 16S, you have a lot of problem in resolving the lower level taxonomy. So you, you, you in most cases, can get to a genus level taxonomy. Uh, but in many cases, you can only get to family level taxonomy. And only rarely can you get down to species and certainly not strain level. Uh, and, and most of those things you can overcome by uh, random uh, shotgun meter genomic sequencing, where you sequence the whole thing. And also in addition to, to, um, to having a good taxonomical profiling, you will also get knowledge about the, the functions, the, the, the proteins that are in a system with the shotgun meter genomics. But, there is a big problem in this, uh, and, and, in and this is a general problem for, for metagenomics, is that of, if this is all of your sequence reads from a sample, you will be able to account for about 20% of those sequence reads by mapping them to reference genomes. So you, ha you, you, you have the majority of the sample, you don't know what it is. And obviously, that's uh, dissatisfying. Um, Moreover, uh, if you use reference genomes for measuring the abundances of, um, of your species, you'll sometimes be very confused. You'll see that some region of the chromosome appears to be in a, in a large and uh, high abundance, whereas other regions of that chromosome seems to be in low abundance. So you're sort of confused. Is this species here or is it not here? And this, these differences can be dramatic. Um, and of course, the reason for that is that there are, uh, in addition to those known species, there are a number of unknown, a lot of unknown species in the system, and they may look even identical to your reference genome at certain regions. And of course, you get a confusion of signal there. Um, and, and altogether, we call this the metagenomic problem. Um, back in 2010, when we first got a very large data set of metagenomics from human stools, 
we, we, uh, were, we started out to try to understand this, and, and, and one of the, the ideas we came up with uh, was that, of course, the genes that are from the same chromosome, they should be approximately at the same abundance in our sample. And if we had a lot of samples, they should follow each other in abundance across those samples. And that, that we call the, the co-abundant principle. So, uh, and, and that principle, uh, you could say that's very simple and, and even naive principle, uh, but it turns out to work extraordinarily well. So I'll, I'll give you, uh, show you an example of that. So here is the abundance of one gene across 1,200 human stool samples. Okay, so in some samples, this gene is highly abundant, and other samples, it's absent or very low abundance. And this gene doesn't travel alone, it travels together with all the other genes from that chromosome. And here now I'm showing you actually 4,000 genes rather than just one. Okay? One gene, 4,000 genes. The genes are, are shown here with extremely thin lines, okay? So you see here's an extremely coherent signal, and, and as such a signal we call um, uh, metagenomic species. Okay. Now, uh, these are these are relative abundances, um, but we, yeah, they are relative abundance. So, so what you get out of this sequencing machine is is you get a number of reads, say uh, uh, ten or twenty million reads, and then you say how many of those reads uh, are, can I map to uh, an entity. And that's, of course, a relative, because also, you know, how much thesis should I look at? And so, yeah, so it is relative, yes. Sorry? And gene what? Copy number. Copy number. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Right, so, so occasionally you have genes that are duplicated in the chromosome, right? So in order, and, and that should sort of dis, distort this, right? Um, so in order to capture these signals, we use Pearson correlation, which doesn't care about the absolute abundance, but it's, it cares about the profile. So it's, it's, in order to do this and make this work really well, you need many samples. In order of, and this depends on the complexity of the system, of course, but in the order of 100 samples, then you can, you can capture a lot of those species. And so we built a, a pipeline for doing this, and I don't want to go into too many details about how that, that works, but, but you take a, a number of samples, a large number of samples, you, you assemble genes in that and make a non-redundant gene catalog, and then you, you take the reads from the original samples and measure the abundance of all of those genes in a gene catalog. And then you have, we have an algorithm, uh, we call it canopy clustering, that's able to sort of segregate these signals out, and then we, got, we get what we call metagenomic species, and they account, they, they, uh, they are, um, we believe that most of them are species, but we also see smaller entities that are phages. Actually, it's not true that the majority are species. The majority are certainly phages and plasmids and, and things like that. Um, but, but, you know, those, those metagenomic species are mostly what is interesting. And we, ad we identify them by, basically by size. And, and here you can see that from using reference genomes, uh, and to using metagenomic species, you can suddenly account for in the order of 73% of your content, okay? That's pretty good, actually, because if you, if you look at bacteria chromosome, about 85% of it is coding, and we're only counting for coding region. So, but we're still missing some percentages, and that's mostly very rare things. If you look at the size distribution of these metagenomic species in terms of number of genes, you will get a distribution that's bimodal, and here it's, a, it's plotted in a log, log scale. So you get this uh, uh, bimodal distribution here where you have what we call metagenomic species, and you have, uh, in addition to that, we have the smaller um, metagenomic units, or CACs, 
but we have, uh, we can identify in humans, we can identify 1,500 metagenomic species, so the large entities that we believe are bacterial genomes in, in uh, most cases. Now, this uh, segregate extremely well, as, as I said. Um, and, and you have probably seen some of those plots that try to segregate uh, uh, genomes using this method based on two samples or, or, or a very few number of samples or, or, or alternatively using base composition, et cetera. And there you get these islands of genes that, are, that can be segregated. But if you use many dimensions, uh, like in this case, we use 2,300 samples from humans, so you get a hyperdimensional space, you can separate things extremely well. And so this, this plot sort of illustrates that. So here, here are our 10 million genes, and, and they are plotted in a space where you have a correlation to the profile of one of the metagenomic species here, and a correlation to one, another metagenomic species here. And these are the genes that belong to that one of those metagenomic species and the genes that belong to the other one. So you see a very strong segregation, and it's not, you know, it, it's not so critical where you put the cutoff for that. You get a very nice segregation. You benchmark those on, on taxonomy. So you take one of those metagenomic species, see what it looks like. There will, uh, there will be some of them that looks like this. So, so this, the, the num metagenomic species number three, Ha is, has a lot of genes that are similar to a blastocystis hominensis, that's an eukaryote, and, and so it has a very high similarity to 15,000 genes of, of that species, uh, and that correspond to 99% uh, of all the genes that are in this metagenomic species, and this is with a high uh, threshold for similarity. And you see that that's the number of those that are almost identical to uh, reference genomes. However, this is the minority of the metagenomic species. In humans, now, with all the accumulated data uh, that, that has been generated, and I, I know there are people, papers that say, oh, we have 1,000 reference genomes. Yes, you have 1,000 reference genomes, but most of them are for the same species. So the actual number of species that we can recognize in the human gut is 300, all of, with all the effort combined. And this is, of course, only a fraction of what, what's there. And so if you look at this picture, and this, now I'm showing you the same measurement as, as I just showed you, the, the percentage of the genes from a metagenomic species that is similar to a, to a reference genome. And you see these are the ones I just showed you here. Those are the ones that are almost identical to a, a metagenomic species, uh, so, sorry, to a reference genome. And here's all of those that are, uh, well, completely unknown uh, or, or similar to something uh, so that may be uh, um, similar to, to the reference genome at the genus level or something. And, and so you can, you, we, you can work with this in, in different level of sensitivity and you get the coherency at, at different taxonomical levels. If you look at, at a human stool samples, you'll, you'll see that this actually described quite a lot of, of the, the data. Uh, and so this is, this is 300 individuals where we, we are account, so this is the richness of those 300 uh, uh, samples in terms of how many metagenomic species we can identify in those samples. And we, I've colored them those that are similar to a, a reference genome in color here based on the phylum, and then the black part is the, the unknown species, right? And, and what you can see here is that the richness at species level here actually correspond quite nicely to the richness at gene level. Gene level is, of course, on a different scale here. That the blue line is the gene level. And also, if you sort, as, as I did here, sort the samples based on, on the, the number of species, you can also see that people, uh, individuals with uh, Crohn's disease are segregating very clearly with a very low richness. This, this can also be done, this segregation of Crohn's using other methods, but it's much clearer if you have this complete view of the system. Um, this, this gives you, as I said, a more, much more comprehensive overview of the system, but it also gives you a much more precise overview of the, of the system. And in, in a number of cases, we have looked at 
uh, the intervention studies where people were eating a probiotic and using reference genome for exactly that probiotics, it was very hard to tell whether that probiotic was actually in the system because it has all of this cross signal to other related species in the, in the system. But if you, use, if, you, uh, if you designed a metagenomic species for that reference genome, you get a very clear signal. Those that didn't take it didn't have it. And you can even see the different abundances uh, that people had of this. And that goes down to, to uh, about five parts per million, um, uh, this accuracy. It also can be used to, to go even, even further down in taxonomical resolution. Um, so we, we're aiming for what we call uh, ultra-high resolution microbiomics. And, and I realized uh, yesterday that that that's not a, a proper uh, term, actually, because uh, I was thinking uh, that ultra-high would be that we could account for the SNVs of the samples, but now I realize that people here actually want <laughs> single-cell genomics, and, and we're not there yet. So, uh, But anyway, if you, if you take one of these metagenomic species, and this is the one that corresponds to uh, Akamentia monistophila, uh, and map all the SNVs across that chromosome, um, uh, you will, you, we can find that, find that there is about 21,000 SNVs across our cohort. And this is the different samples here. So there are 700 samples here. Uh, and in these samples, this species is very low abundance. But up here, it's pretty uh, high abundance. And you can see that it, it, there are what I will call um, subspecies um, population structures here. And, and you might, may want to call this a strain or, or a clade. And, and something, up here we have something that's, that's more complex, but clearly different from this. Uh, one of the, the interesting things here is that uh, up in this block, you have a lot of, of the individuals that have IBD, so the Crohn's disease or Alzheimer's colitis, where their, their Archimentia strain apparently seem to be more sort of, uh, they have different strains of them. And we can use all of this information to build phylogenetic trees of those of this species directly from the GOT data. And actually, we found that rather than trying to call these for strains, it's much more informative to use a tree for doing our association analysis. And, and this, this picture is trying to, sh to show uh, an attempt for an association analysis between the um, this, this uh, st structure and, and uh, human phenotype. So what you can do here is you can label the, um, the um, notes of this tree um, according to a human phenotype, for example, and then you can, you can make an association between the distances in this tree and this uh, phenotype. Uh, and potentially, you can even zoom in to which SNVs are associated with that um, phenotype. I'm going to switch now on to focus on diabetes. So diabetes, and, and when I say diabetes, I, I mean type 2 diabetes, OK? It's not type 1 diabetes. It's, as, as you, you probably know, it's, it's a global phenomenon, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's a very um, substantial problem. And, and actually, it's not only in, in the uh, rich countries, but it's very severe in the um, um, Arabic countries, um, but it's basically everywhere, and and it's it's one of the biggest uh, sort of cost problem for for our uh, healthcare systems uh, worldwide, and it's increasing. So so type two diabetes is, if you break it down, it's basically two things. You you have a B cell dysfunction, so low amount of insulin produced. And then you have also insulin resistance, so low, lower level of sensitivity to insulin. And the number of factors have been associated with insulin resistance, um, age, obesity, um, uh, your diet, um, and how much you exercise, and of course genetics. But also recently, recently there has been a number of papers indicating that the gut microbiome could be an, a factor in this. The first. The first paper that actually made a, a real association study between the gut microbiome 
and, uh, and any human disease was actually this paper that, that showed um, that there was an association between type 2 diabetes and, and the mi microbiome. Um, and there's been a number of, of studies since that that has confirmed that. Uh, among them, uh, the Swedish studies were, that also showed that this was indeed the case also in um, elder women. Uh, but then in 2015, we observed that, that the treatment that the diabetes patients was taking, namely, um, or in most cases, uh, the first line uh, di uh, drug against diabetes is metformin, and that that uh, drug actually seemed to uh, influence our signal so much uh, that that was basically what we were, had been seeing in those papers, so that the actual effect of type 2 diabetes was much harder to, to observe. Um, and actually, very recently, there's been a paper that actually claims that part of the mechanism of uh, metformin is to change the microbiome uh, in such a way that it's more healthy for uh, and alleviating some of the gut microbiome uh, problems for in type 2 diabetes. Anyway, all of these problems with the pe people that were using metformin uh, made us uh, go for people that were pre-diabetics, uh, and, and instead of looking for actually uh, people that was classified with type 2 diabetes, we were looking at, at pre-diabetics uh, and, and using their insulin sensitivity measures to, um, to associate uh, with the microbiome. And to further get into a mechanistic understanding of this, we also uh, looked at um, um, the metabolome of, of the serum of these individuals, and, and, and in, in doing this relatively complicated association of work, we, we, uh, we came up with this um, uh, outline of, of our um, uh, association. So we get around 1,100 uh, metabolites from um, 300 uh, patients, or across those, when uh, then we can, we're doing some effort to uh, redundancy reduce this, this uh, data. Uh, for in the metabolites, we do co-abundance clustering, uh, and this is, this is a classical way of dealing with metabolites. It's, it's known that metabolites that come from the same pathways, they sort of uh, have similar abundances, and very similar metabolites also tend to have uh, similar abundances across a cohort of individuals. So, so in order to reduce the complexity, we did co-abundance clustering of that and reduced that to 74 uh, metabolites. And similarly, as I just explained, we did with the uh, microbiome, we used this co-abundance clustering to identify uh, a little more than 700 species here and also a number of functional groups here. And then next, we used the uh, clinical data to uh, filter out those uh, metabolites that were more interesting and also those species that were more interesting to look for. And then it reduced that further to 19 uh, metabolite clusters and uh, um, 81 species that were uh, associated with the phenotype. And, and after that, we were trying to see if we can um, make association between those domains of data uh, um, at the, so connecting species to metabolites uh, and exp that could explain the, the human phenotype. Now, in doing that, you're, you're getting into a huge complexity problem here with the, the many different species that are able to, to actually produce the same metabolites, and the host is also able to do that, and you're eating food, and, and probably a lot of this is going on in the small intestine, and we're measuring uh, in the stool. So, you know, we're pretty far from, from, from what we, an, an ideal situation. Um, but, so in order to, to deal with this, we came up with, with a new concept we call the functional species concept, and this is chopped off a little bit here. But anyway, so the idea is, is that ac across different ecosystems, you may have different species that can fill the same uh, ecological niche or the same function as, as for example, in, in macroscopic ecosystem, you could have different top predators in, across different ecosystems, or on a savanna, you can have a lion, or in, and in, in, in the jungle, maybe a tiger, and in the ocean, a shark. And if you were trying to do an association to the 
top predator effect across those systems, you completely miss it, right? Because we're three different species. But if you could somehow group those species that share the property uh, in some way, you could you could use that grouping to make your association. And this is sort of and this is then what we we did here. So so it, it looks. Uh, like this in the microbiome. So, for example, here you have a phenotype that, a human phenotype that could be the BMI, and you have a number of species that that you can associate it to that. But maybe they are each of them has a weak association because different people may have different species that fill that function. Um, and if you didn't know that uh, they were shared a function, you will, you will only have this level of association. But if you're able to group them, you will be able to find. Uh, we believe uh, a stronger association. Um, and, and in saying that, I should say, if you, uh, and some of the early papers in microbiome uh, association were, were just trying to combine random sets of gene, uh, species in this. And remember, we have in the order of, of 700 common species in the gut. So if you combine just three of those, that would be 700 times 699 times 698, right? You have approximately 300 million combinations. And that's not good for your multi-testing. Um, but, but using a system where you're looking for shared properties uh, or, or just species that have an alter look, then you reduce that complexity by about 500,000 time, 500, times, down to in the order of a couple of thousand uh, groups of species. And these groups also can vary in size. So there, some uh, have uh, 50 species in it, and some only have very few. And so it, it looks pretty much like this. You, uh, the simplest form of this is that you use the eggnog annotation. So that's autolog annotation of the genes, and you can just uh, group those species. And this, this is a, maybe a little bit similar to guilt, uh, building guilt. But, but here, any one species can actually be a member of many groups, right? And, and many of those groups are not meaningful or not relevant for this case, but you can do association with them. And, and here's an example of such an association where you see that uh, this is an association to BMI, and, and where we, we, we here's uh, sort of the expected uh, association between BMI and, and all species, and here's the association of the group of species that can uh, deconjugate bile acid. That's the first step in degradation of bile acid. And, and, and so that shows a very nice association between, the ability, or between species that can uh, degrade bile acid and being lean. And, and, and in addition to being a nice way of, of doing associations, this association also comes with a legend, right? They also come with a description that these species are the ones that can Great bile acid here, right? And 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 if you ask a physiologist, bile acid would be one of the things that you see that are key for regulation of, of satiety uh, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, the the metabolism in humans. In addition to this, there is there is a big problem in in annotating functions in uh, for genes. Um, you would think maybe that the similarity of, of a gene uh, should uh, indicate bit, uh, its function. You can, be, you can transfer the function from one known uh, gene to another gene by its similarity. And it works pretty well in many cases, but there is a large false discovery rate on this. And, and because we have these metagenomic species, uh, and we have some uh, complex uh, pathways systems, like, for example, the KEC, we're able to look for pathways completion in species. And this is, this is uh, an example of that. This is the LPS uh, pathway. And you see that there is a huge number of species that have annotated just one gene from that pathway. This is likely not, um, you know, it, maybe it's a false annotation or it, that function is also used in another pathway. That's likely. But you see that there is a bimodal distribution of, of these, the number of genes that you find in this pathway. And, and so we, we believe that, that it's a much more accurate description of which species are actually able to, to do this function if we require a certain number of, of the genes in the pathway to be present in that. And you can see this as a this nice little bimodal. 
distribution. Um, and so we did this across all, all functions and, and association to the uh, metabytes of humans. And what we found was that there were a number of sort of pathways that could be, uh, uh, or a met sorry, functional species group that was defined based on pathways that could be associated with metabolites. And in very many cases, the, the, the uh, product of those um, the pathways actually were uh, some of the elements that were in these um, metabolite clusters. For example, the branch chain of amino acids um, metabolites were nicely associated with the, by the, the capability to biosynthesize those, and it was inversely correlated to the bacteria's ability to uptake branch chain amino acids. Branch chain amino acids already uh, a known indicator uh, for uh, a pre-diabetic, okay, pre-diabetic uh, individuals that have elevated levels of branched chain amino acids in the serum has a higher chance of becoming type two diabetics. It's it's funny note here that if you go to a gym, one of the things that you, they will sell you is exactly branched chain amino acids to build muscles, right? And and so I, I think actually. Uh, it's, it's very likely that branch chain amino acids is, is, is a good thing to have if you exercise a lot, but if you don't, it's probably not such a good idea. So the model we, we built based on this was, was like, like this, that we have some gut microbes um, that are able to, um, to produce uh, these branch chain amino acids, and they are contributed to a metabolite pool that uh, will, in turn, influence the insulin resistance of the host. On the other side, you also have some bacteria that can uptake branched chain amino acids and, and consume them. And they, of course, count uh, in a different direction of this. In order to zoom in on which species were sort of the, the worst uh, species for doing that, we, we made a, a leave one out analysis of this, and that basically means that we repeated the association analysis, but just taking one species out and saw how much worse were the association. And so you, you for example, you, you say here, if you have, um, 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 you have a correlation between a human phenotype and, and, and the, the presence of, uh, of the species in, in such a functional species group, you, if you remove some species, you get a much reduced association. And if you, do, if you do that for the branch chain amino acids, we, we found that there were a lot of species that had a very minor effect on this association, but there were a couple of species that had a quite dramatic effect, and one of those were Prevotella corpori, uh, and another one was Bacteroides vulgatus, and then there were another couple of Prevotellas that were important uh, for this association. Um, and also, uh, however, for the branch chain amino acid transport, we didn't find some any species that were really strong for this. It was seemed that there were a lot of species that can uh, uptake this, and uh, that can be important for the system. And and so to to sort of conclude on on that, um, uh, and all of this is I, I I agree. This is all associations and and things that fit nicely together, but it's just you know. Association. So, so to go further with this, we we isolated the Prevotella and 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 gave that to to 12 mice uh, on a high fat diet, and we could see after um, I believe it was, so we could see already after three weeks we could see elevated level of the branch chain amino acid in serum of these mice, and we could also see that uh, their insulin sensitivity were significantly higher, and actually um, a number of those species, uh, or sorry, a number of those mice actually had uh, what you would uh, classify as type 2 diabetes after four or five weeks. Uh, so it, it, this suggests that, that this study is not only association, but you can actually uh, inoculate these bacteria into um, at least mice and see that the phenotype occurs. So this was, this was my main story, and, and, uh, and I, I have very little time for additional stuff here. Um, so if there's questions, uh, I could take them. 